Welcome to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Doug Becker. In this hour, we interview Scholar Circle founder Maria Armudian, who's published a book on international human rights and the role that international lawyers have played at advancing cases against human rights abusers. Human rights internationally are bound by the legal principle of national sovereignty what we international relations scholars call the Westphalian system. What this means is that nations, countries, are the entities that are expected to protect human rights. But human rights are universal. We have these rights because we're human, not because we're American, Russian, South African, Nigerian. So how can international actors compel these states to protect human rights? As a legal issue, lawyers have played a creative and essential role at advancing the universality of human rights in light of really what's been a mixed record of national protections. Scholar Circle founder and personal friend, Maria Armudian has written a wonderful new book on the role that attorneys have played in advancing international human rights. The book is called Lawyers Beyond Borders, Advancing International Human Rights Through Local Laws and Courts. Maria Armudian is a lecturer at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and of course is the host and anchor of this show, Scholar Circle. Maria, thank you so much for being able to join us, talk about your blog. What fun it is to be on my you know, program that now you are the host of. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you. And it's, it's, it's an honor to be able to interview you. And it was an honor to be able to read this book. Did you read the whole thing? I have read the whole thing. You're amazing. <laughs> so um, the first question, you really portray an incredible creativity on the part of lawyers to be able to find courts that would consider themselves to have the jurisdiction to actually hear these cases. Just how creative have these have these international human rights lawyers been? Yeah, so I think there are a few things to say there. First of all, from your introduction, you were talking about the Westphalian system and national sovereignty and, you know, all of these ideas, really. I mean, the book is as much about ideas and about how we have become, you know, we adhere to these ideas as if they are facts. And one of the things in researching this book is just how they become a reality until somebody comes along with a better idea, or it, maybe it's not a better idea, but is persuasive enough because of the creative way they have framed these issues um, and juxtapose them against the problems of the day. So that's what is going on. The creativity aspect, I mean, the story of Peter Weiss is fairly well known in the legal circles, but not as well known in the rest of the world. I think one of the most important things here is to say that the story that I tell in Lawyers Beyond Borders is pretty uniquely American. And what I mean by that is that the civil rights movement, you know, was alive and well, and lawyers were using civil litigation to advance rights for those whose rights had been trampled upon. You know, um, you know, you start if you go back into, you know, the 1950s when they passed Brown versus Board of Education, for example, and they managed to get um, uh, segregation declared illegal. It, this, as these rights were being built for one group, the lawyers would then say, OK, there are enough lawyers working on this area. There are other groups that also need representation and have had their rights also trampled upon. And so they kept looking for um, ways to advance rights for other groups. And these lawyers in the book are that of that ilk. They are civil rights lawyers. And Peter Weiss was in a unique position. And I always say I had the great honor to interview him. He's in his 90s. He did this particular case that started this movement in the U.S., in 1979, the decision was in 1980, it's called Falartica versus Peña Irala. Weiss was steeped in both movements, he, the human rights movement and the US civil rights movement. 
And so he had this unique purview of the ideas that were fueling the international human rights movement. And one of those ideas was the idea of universal jurisdiction. This is key, right? Universal jurisdiction, of course, just means that some crimes are so heinous and so awful that they should be prosecuted anywhere and everywhere. And to him, he calls that the constitution of the world, part of the constitution of the world. So he just needed ways to test that because these were all test cases in the United States to see how far they could expand these rights. Could he actually represent um, what they call foreign cubed, uh, a, a case that was foreign cubed, represent people who were foreign so the plaintiff is foreign, the defendant was foreign, the wrong was committed in a foreign country. And he thought, well, um, in some cases, it would fall under universal jurisdiction. How can I do that? So he and his colleagues at the Center for Constitutional Rights unearthed the Alien Tort Statute, um, which really was a simple law that the first Congress passed when they were talking about the jurisdiction of the judiciary, right? Like what can the federal courts do? And they said, you know, aliens have access to our courts. The federal courts have jurisdiction when those violations, those torts, the civil wrongs, uh, when they violate international law. And he thought, well, that is just a good, just as good of a, you know, universal jurisdiction statute that I could ever find. And so he tested it. And it was through the Court of Appeals that they said, yep, torture is one of those horrific crimes. And what had happened in the Philardica case was that um, Juanito Philardica was uh, a teenager and he was tortured to death by a military man in Paraguay. His father, uh, Joel Philardica, and his sister, Dolly Philardica, had come to the U.S. looking for the torturer, America, uh, Peña Irala, and did find him. They managed to find him so they could serve him papers and take him to court and get a judgment and then get him deported. Well, that meant that they weren't going to collect the $10 million judgment, but it did mean um, that they got him out of the United States and they got a sort of declarative victory, a moral victory. They didn't get their boy back, you know. Juelito was dead um, and died a horrible uh, death, but it was something. And that's what these lawyers have continued to do. You raised an issue that I'd like to sort of explore a bit too, is in a lot of these cases, I mean, these are civil cases. So this, yes. is, this is a civil court, not a criminal court, right. which means even if the defendant is found liable, not guilty, but liable, uh, the, the penalty is frequently a monetary penalty and almost never, except in some cases with corporations, almost never gets paid. And so you raise the question about punishment and, and of course, some notion of justice. Whenever I, I think of these cases, though, I wonder, is this really about discovery, about establishing legally what happened so that there is a narrative that, um, you know, in the case you cited in the Philardiga case, we know the facts now because it's been established in a court. Is that the primary motivation? So kind of a naming and shaming or how much actual punishment can be attached to this? I think, first of all, it's different for every plaintiff, right? For every survivor of a human rights violation. But I think that what has happened through this process, which started with Peter Weiss and then grew and changed and was creatively altered, from that point until today by the follow-up lawyers. But one of the ideas that came out of this process was actually uh, put forward by Senator Kennedy. And then it was put forward by a therapist who said, you know, one of the things that happens when people are violated egregiously, like with torture, is that their agency is just essentially destroyed. And part of this process actually is meant to restore agency. It's meant to transform the person from victim to plaintiff, and then to point a finger at their accuser and say, you did this and have a court say to them, yes, he did this. 
and it was wrong. And that has some kind for some people a restorative effect. Now, if that person happens to have money, assets, and that's a big judgment, you know, a lot of times people who've been violated uh, are not able to work in normal ways, you know, so it helps to um, put back together a life that might have been destroyed. And this would be the case, for example, in some of these um, indigenous communities where their lives were completely upended by, say, you know, oil exploration or pipeline infrastructure or, you know, all kinds of things like this, where, you know, they can no longer live the lives that they were living in their indigenous culture. Some of them were subsistence farmers because they can't grow anything anymore, but they've also been violated so badly that there's a sense of loss of agency and trauma, PTSD. So that I would say there are multiple reasons for this. And when they did settle with some of the corporations and some of the private contractors in the war on terror cases, there was monetary redress. And in one case, um, one of the violator had come to the United States and had won the lottery and they got all that money. And so <laughs> there are cases where there are assets. And so there is a punishment in a way. And yes, it establishes the facts for if there is a criminal prosecution down the line, that is one of the things that can happen. They can feed this into uh, criminal prosecutions, but I think it's mostly victim centered. It's mostly, you know, and also as the civil rights movement was trying to do, trying to establish law, good law that gives people rights and so frequently, the survivors have nowhere else to go, nowhere else to get justice. Their own countries are not, you know, set up with proper courts. Um, the international courts are not necessarily, you know, set up in a way that everybody's going to get, you know, properly heard. So this was just one additional route, one more pathway to justice. You're listening to the Scholar Circle scholarcircle.org. We're discussing international human rights and legal remedies with Maria Armudian, who's written a new book called Lawyers Beyond Borders. So Maria, one of the things that it's always been a concern of mine broadly, and your book raises this as well, is the, the role the U.S. has played as the jurisdiction, as this universal jurisdiction, in particular through the alien torts statute. You asserted this, this question about universal jurisdiction and what makes the ATS so, so unique is it has this universal jurisdiction, which is another way of saying Americans don't have to be involved in the case at all as the plaintiff, as the defendant, and certainly not the location of the, of the human rights violation for American courts to, to hear the case. How problematic is that, that yeah, the idea I've, that the U.S. is, yeah. I don't have a problem with it at all, actually, but... Uh, the Supreme Court has had a problem with it, and that is why it has uh, handed down some judgments that have said, um, ex you know, the alien tort statute needs uh, for these cases to move forward. It has to touch and concern the United States. However, that said, that has made it really difficult to, you know, confront corporations for their um, roles in these human rights violations. And there were several cases like this. However, in the 90s, started in the 1980s, actually, but by the 1990s, 96, I believe it was, Congress was actually quite excited about this concept of universal jurisdiction and passed, and George Bush I signed into law, um, a follow-up um, statute to support the Alien Tort Claims Act called the Torture Victim Protection Act. And so in this case, what they said was, ah, you know what? We want to expand this uh, to also include Americans who might've been harmed abroad, but also we want this to be model legislation for other countries so that torturers have nowhere to go. And no matter where they go, their victims can find them and sue them. Well, that, 
became law. And the issue with it is that you can take on individuals if you can find them and serve them papers um, and get them into a court of law. But that is where the corporate part does not get addressed at all. And they're frankly where the big problems are often. I will say, however, there was a big case against Syria that uh, found Syria um, well liable for, um, gosh, I can't remember how many dollars it was. It was up, uh, upwards of 200 million in the case of targeted killing of a journalist, of Marie Colvin, and her sister sued the Syrian Republic. And um, so that is a case in which the court did allow it to go through. I know there's similar cases like Terry Anderson suing Iran for, uh, yes. you know, for, for being seized as a hostage. But, but one of the challenges here, when you mentioned contemporary cases, the Supreme Court heard a couple of cases, and actually we got the ruling in June of this year of two corporations that had benefited from child labor, Nestle yes. v. Dole and Cargill v. Doe. And one of the challenges here seems to be that the court wasn't convinced that simply benefiting from the human rights violation is enough to punish the corporation. That the yeah, corporation, or hold liable or hold civilly liable because they weren't really punishing really, right? They were just trying to hold them civilly liable. Right. So, I mean, isn't that just one of the challenges generally? That, I mean, well, if they, and, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, again, it is the, that is the Supreme Court making law, right? Um, and that is the, that's the issue of extraterritoriality that we were talking about earlier in which the Supreme Court said in order to use the alien tort statute, the issue has to touch and concern the United States. And what does that mean exactly, right? So in uh, previous cases, uh, the lower courts, the appellate courts had allowed cases to move forward when the decision was made in the United States, because that's the decision that, you know, then, especially if it was knowingly made that people were going to be killed or tortured or, something like that massacred. And, but this time the court did not allow that to be enough to touch and concern the United States. There are some lawyers that are really great who were subject to this book. One is Paul Hoffman who teaches at University of California, Irvine, um, and used to teach at USC uh, with you, Doug. <laughs> but he, he's the guy who argued that before the Supreme Court. And then he's one of the key uh, lawyers involved in this movement and has argued so many of the cases, both before the Supreme Court and in the appellate courts, and understands the legal rulings with the nuances that me as a political scientist that I couldn't possibly get uh, as well as a lawyer could. Now, the book is, and, and you say this even earlier, you acknowledge this, it's pretty American-centric and, and, and this approach. But when you think of Issues and, and this actually was more, you know, a criminal prosecution rather than than a civil case. Immediately, one case that comes to mind was the rather famous case of the attempt to extradite Augusto Pinochet, the former, you know, Chilean strongman, you know, dictator, you know, by the Spanish judge Baltasar Garzón. I guess one of the concerns with that, though, was of course here's Spain trying, uh, at least a Spanish judge, trying to try a Chilean general. To outsiders, it looked awfully neo-colonial. If you're not going to prosecute your own crimes, we'll prosecute them for you. How much is that a concern? Yeah, you said that you weren't as concerned because you wanted to see these cases brought brought forward, but there's clearly a power component in what country is actually hearing these cases. So I think two things on that. There is that argument, but um, again, I think that we've got to heed the pain and suffering of the survivors. And if they cannot get any kind of justice anywhere else in the world, who is going to hear the case? Who is at least going to hear them? And so somebody has to step up. By the way, Spain doesn't do this anymore. And um, you know, one of the lawyers in the book, Almudena Bernabeu, who's remarkable uh, as well, she tried to bring a case um, for a woman uh, whose brother was killed in Syria. 
And uh, this was to get around the jurisdictional issues because Spain said, similar to the Supreme Court of touch and concern in terms of extraterritoriality, that the victim has to be uh, Spanish. And in this case, the sister lost her brother, but they said it wasn't enough. So Spain's not even doing these cases anymore. However, Germany is doing some. So it is really interesting to see how far we go. Now, back to what I was trying to do with the book. Now, obviously it's a political history and it's a political history of a particular movement. Um, and I focused on the Americas because I found it's such a profound um, effort to do something when nobody else was doing anything. But it's also, like I said earlier on, it's a story that is American in that it's about making rights. It's about building rights. And from, from kind of a ground floor or negative ground floor, and what does it take to build rights? You know, if somebody tests a case, if you can get enough affirmative judgment, then other lawyers come on and they go, oh, well, maybe we can, we can do another case. And then you get more and more lawyers and more and more cases. And then you've got a fabric of rights. And once you've got that fabric of rights, then you can go, oh, well, where else can this apply? That's what fascinated me the most. Now, of course, what you're getting at now is also that even these American lawyers, even Peter Weiss, was so frustrated, particularly with the war on terror, that he went abroad and helped set up an NGO to do similar kinds of things with universal jurisdiction, which is, and Germany was the place where he found the best statute. So that, so it is happening to some degree in Europe. It's a completely different system. It's not the, you know, the uh, civil litigation system that the Americans have, which we sort of evolved out of the Brits. One of the developments that have come out of the ATS cases and, and what you're describing here has been this call for some sort of a universal court that can hear these cases. The International Court of Justice, of course, can only hear cases with nations of stand, you know, withstanding, and the International Criminal Court, which has in many ways been politically compromised, you know, in some ways they can, but they can hear criminal cases if you can expand this. Should the focus be on more, you know, more international jurisdiction, you know, perhaps through the UN system? I know there's been a couple of proposals, you know, on this. So an example for, you know, on, on corporations is, I mean, there's been a treaty that's been proposed at the UN for years, authored by John Ruggie, who just sadly just passed away. But the so-called draft norms uh, treaty yeah. that would give the UN the capability to at least I mean, the UN can hear petitions, maybe even possibly be a court. I understand your argument that it's about political viability right now. And right now, you know, the US has offered at least an avenue, uh, which is better than nothing. But should the legal focus be on trying to create international institutions that, that, that can hear these cases? Look, I think that is important. And as you note, there are some politically compromised issues that arise in those systems as well, um, including at the United Nations. So yes, we should have international systems and we should find ways to um, limit those kinds of political compromises that are happening. But I think at the same time, creatively finding ways in other jurisdictions is fine finding ways to um, apply universal jurisdiction is good. And I say that again, because it is not okay. It is not morally okay to leave millions of people without recourse and without redress. And the system right now under this sovereign nation system makes it nearly impossible for so many people to get any sort of justice, to get their lives back, to get their agency back, to get their bodies back. So something has to be done and something has to be done kind of quickly. And so I think expedience is what drove these lawyers to do it in the United States. It's where they were, it's what they could do, it's the tools that they had. And so let's do something for somebody. 
and by the, that really is the narrative of the book is the use of the create you know these creative uses to find some form um some avenue of justice for victims so even issues i'm raising is asking is there a better way to do it not probably you know, <laughs> It probably, it probably is, is, but it would take a very long time, Doug. And I think that's what I'm getting at, right? Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to wait until all the victims are dead and have suffered and their families are suffering? And then there's, you know, all the sort of communal post-traumatic stress. And then, of course, there's the epigenetic transference of trauma. You know, it's, it's like, we, you know, how long do people have to wait? Do they have to wait for, you know, how long did John Rogie work on this? And he now he's he has passed on and hopefully somebody will pick up the baton. But really, can we really expect something to happen like tomorrow? No. So there should be other ways that we can make a difference. There should be other means that people can get justice. And you know, the American court system was one of them. And now it's not as strong. Um, that might change, it could change. I hope it does. Because um, there are a lot of survivors that come to the United States as refugees. And you know what, guess what? So do their torturers. They come here too, and they end up living here. And in one of the cases, there was a, a young woman who was, she had taken refuge in Atlanta, Georgia, took a job in a hotel, and guess what? So did her torturer. The guy who tortured her was working at that same hotel. Now, how much peace does she get? Shouldn't she be able to sue him? With the Torture Victim Protection Act, she can. And to end on a slightly, you know, optimistic note, let's ask the question here is, you know, even those cases that I've cited from June of this year, the uh, Nestle v. Doe and, and Cargill v. Doe, there was some expectation that the Supreme Court was basically going to throw the alien torts statute out and say you can't sue corporations, though the victims, the, the children who are compelled to work, you know, in these slave labor conditions on the uh, coca farms, they didn't win. The court did not close that avenue off. And so I, I imagine you expect there's going to be more cases coming forward. I don't know at this point. I know that the, one of the big issues that I touched on in the book is that the, these lawyers who do these cases are civil rights lawyers, and they have their hands full at home. They are having to take on massive amounts of police abuse cases, Black Lives Matter cases, and civil rights erosion at so many corners that they that it's pretty hard to then take on the international cases. Also, if they are going to be, um, if they're not going to change law for the good. So I know there's some a contemplate, contemplation among these lawyers about, you know, where are we most useful? What do we need to do? So I think there will be in the future. And by the way, Brett Kavanaugh, um, in his previous job uh, as an appellate court justice, uh, did say that corporations shouldn't be able to be sued using the ATS. And so, yes, I think there was some fear that his thinking would end up being the ruling of the day. However, that said, in the Roberts court, I think the strongest effort under Roberts is that he's trying to get as much agreement as possible. And so they're narrowing their decisions down to very small um, increments, even though they're upending so much of what I think the United States had, had been about. They are not doing it in fell swoops yet. They might with abortion. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so, you know, kind of a line I love to give my classes is watch this space here. There's, some, there's going to be some interesting developments. But the good news is everyone who is interested in these issues with a, just a remarkable detailing of cases, you know, filled with narratives, filled with cases and filled with stories of how just how wonderfully creative and committed these lawyers have been at trying to find some form of justice on these human rights issues. The book is called Lawyers Beyond Borders, Advancing International Human Rights Through Local Laws and Courts. The author is Maria Armudian, lecturer at the University of Auckland in New Zealand and a host, anchor, and creator <laughs> of this show, The Scholar Circle. Thank you very much, Maria. Thanks so much, Doug. This was great fun.